louder? Yes, awesome. So Pastor Josh is on vacation. He's in Florida this week. Uh, it's not so bad here, though. It's not snowing. It's not blowing sideways at 40 miles an hour while snowing. This is a good thing, right? Right? Now here's the bad news. It's supposed to snow tomorrow. How many of you are done with the season of winter? Officially? Yes, absolutely. Let's take a look at our scripture. Uh, if you turn in your Bibles to John 21, we're going to start in verse 15. But before we do that, I just want to give you a little bit of background. So this story is after the resurrection. Jesus has risen from the dead, and he's appeared to the disciples several times already. Um, but he's never conversed with Peter. He's never had a conversation with this disciple named Peter. And this is, the story comes right after uh, the discourse that we talked about last week with Doubting Thomas that we really probably shouldn't call Doubting Thomas. It comes right after that. So uh, let's, let's take a look. John 21, 15 through 19. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, John, or he answered yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. We, li we live in a culture today that is obsessed with emotion. It's all around us for years and years and years. Who wants to hazard a guess about what the top grossing movie of all times is? Come on. Titanic? Nope. Kathy, you're cheating. You're looking at the screen back there. Uh, oh, you didn't? Somebody else said Gone with the Wind. I thought it was Kathy. Okay, uh, the top money-making movie of all time is Avatar. Uh, I just have to throw this in because I'm a fan. The second top is Star Wars. But when you adjust for inflation, Gone with the Wind. Something like $318 billion dollars. Gone with the Wind has made. And what about music? We are obsessed with emotion in our music, be it love or hatred or happiness. Last year, the number one song. Oh, are you, do you have the sound muted? Oh no, oh no, I forgot to warn you. In all the clubs you get in using my name. You think you broke my heart, oh girl, for goodness. Not really about love, more about hate, but this I'm is Justin Bieber. And lest you think that it's just this year, and I didn't want not just this year. Last year, let me see here, last year, no, 10 years ago, Bleeding Heart by Leona Lewis. 20 years ago, Shania Twain, still the one. My year of birth, 1976. Oh man, I forgot it's this videotape. I gotta quit doing this. So everything in our culture, we are surrounded by emotions, emotions, emotions. We even invented a new language to express our emotions. In 1999, Shigetaka Kurita, say that five times fast, invented the subject of the movie we're showing this Friday night, the emoji. 
all of these things just to express the emotions that we feel. As of 2017, there were 2,666 emojis. And this year, they're adding another 157. Also, we can get our emotional fix and express it in little pictures in our text messages. Now, year, the year 2011 was apparently the year of the really, really long book title. Gretchen Rubin wrote a book called The Happiness Project, or Why I Spent a Year Trying to Sing in the Morning, Clean My Closets, Fight Right, Read Aristotle, and Generally Have Fun. She sat on a bus, and in a moment of deep meditation, asked the age-old question, what do I want from my life anyway? And she decided that she wanted to be happy. My son's, one of my son's favorite songs is Pharrell Williams' Happy, you know that one from Despicable Me. It turns out that if you search for happiness on Google, it yields 75 million results. And if you search for books on Amazon with happiness in the subject, 40,000 volumes on the topic. But here's the thing, in our culture today, happiness has moved from like what Aristotle thought about happiness back way long time, BC time, that it was contentment in living the virtuous life, to today happiness being really the great organizing principle of our life. We live to be happy. And in the end, that's really just hedonistic selfishness, isn't it? An entire culture of people chasing their own best gains. If you've ever gotten an email from me, you've often seen that I sign my email the, 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 before my name, Shalom. Does anybody know what the word Shalom means? Extreme peace. That's a that's a good basic definition. But it goes deeper than that. The concept of shalom, is, it's a Hebrew word, and they use it in both greeting and saying goodbye. It's a desire for peace, harmony, completeness, prosperity, welfare, wholeness. When Jesus says, peace, I leave you, that's what he says, shalom. So which is better, the temporal happiness that we seek for and that culture pushes at us, or this idea of wholeness in Christ? Cornelius Plantinga, I think I said that right, he's an Old Testament scholar, says this, Shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness, delight, a rich state of affairs in which needs are satisfied and natural gifts fruitfully employed. A state of affairs that inspires joyful wonder as its creator and savior opens doors and welcomes the creature in whom he delights. Shalom, in other words, is the way things ought to be. How many of you know the word holistic? It means the whole picture, right? In medicine, it means not just traditional medicine like antibiotics and surgeries, but it also means the natural side of medicine. What Jesus is talking about, what scripture is talking about, what this quote is talking about is a holistic view of our well-being that's connected to one another's well-being. Our happiness not being in a vacuum of our own need, but our happiness being felt and found in the connections that we have with others' well-being. We've occasionally used an affirmation of faith in this service and in the other service as well from the United Church of Canada. It begins and ends with the same phrase, we are not alone. And it goes on to say, we live in God's world. We live together with each other. Culture drives us towards selfish narcissism. But scripture calls us together into a wholeness, into this idea of shalom. Our scripture used, this morning used the word love several times. 
Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? We have one English word for love. Love. Greek, Old Testament, or New Testament was written in Greek. Four words. Storge, which means the familial love between parent and child. Filio, which is where we get Philadelphia. A lot of you have heard this before. Brotherly love. Agape, this higher form of love, like God's love is toward us. And then eros, the sexual love, romantic love. And it seems to be this love that culture is bent toward right now. Anthropologist Helen Fisher says, we are born to love. That feeling of romantic love is so deeply embedded in our brains. But even I question if it can last. The truth is, nowhere in scripture is the eros form of loved work, of love used. Nowhere. It's funny, uh, worship leaders... We have this phrase that we use with each other Um, when we're referring to a certain kind of worship song. We call it the Jesus is my boyfriend song. Think about it. A lot of worship songs that, that are written today, you could very easily insert your boyfriend's name or your girlfriend's name in place of Jesus and it would work really well, right? It all comes from an episode of South Park. Anybody ever watch South Park? Anybody want to admit to ever watching South Park? Come on, I see the nods. You know you have. So in one episode, Cartman decides he wants to start a band. And he's failing pretty badly at it. So he decides to take, he decides to to form a Christian band instead. And he takes uh, secular love songs and puts Jesus in the name instead of the boy or girlfriend's name. And he makes it really big. The thing is that there are those songs that have been written, and we try not to do them very often here, but they really don't say much about Jesus. They just focus on this romantic, idealized thing that we have, and they don't say what Jesus is really about. Now, in the Old Testament... When God is wooing Israel to himself, the concept of romantic love is there. In the Song of Solomon, or in some of the Psalms, but even there, the love that is expressed is perfected by this agape love of the Father. A concept of a higher, deeper, truer love. The culture that we live in expresses a love devoid of of the action that is associated with God's love toward us. It's an emotional construct. When we all know that love is not really just an emotion. How many of you have heard the band DC Talk? I'm aging myself again. DC Talk is a Christian band from the 90s, 80s, 90s, early 2000s. And... Uh, Josh Natch, since Josh isn't here, I'm going to kind of bust on him a little bit. Josh really likes DC Talk. And they have this song called Love is a Verb. And I'm not going to read the lyrics to you because have you ever heard a pastor try and read contemporary lyrics like D. James Kennedy or Alistair Begg? It comes off like, uh, never mind. It doesn't come off well. But Josh knows every word to the song Love is a Verb. Every single word. When we were in Florida last last year or two years ago at a conference together, we're driving down International Drive in Orlando and he's blaring DC talk from his iPod on the radio and singing love as a verb at the top of his lungs and somewhere on my phone, I have a video of it. (laughs) But I couldn't find it. The truth is that love is much more than just an emotion or the emotionalism that our culture assigns to it. Dieter, uh, I'm going to try and pronounce his last name, Yukdorf, I think that's right. He's a a pastor from Czechoslovakia, and my iPad shut off, so give me a second. 
There we go. He says this, true love requires action. We can speak of love all day long. We can write notes or poems that proclaim it, sing songs that praise it and preach sermons that encourage it. But until we manifest that love in action, our words are nothing but sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Let's go back to Peter. But not the Peter of John 21. Let's look at the Peter of Matthew 4.19. This is when Jesus walks up to Peter for the first time and says, lay down your nets and follow me. I will make you a fisher of men. Three years of ministry with Jesus walking by his side. 24-7, Peter not always asking the most wise questions, sometimes being a very impertinent disciple, impulsive, impatient, but always seeking. Three years of ministry. Three times denying Christ after the crucifixion. And now what do we find him doing in John 21? He's out in a boat with his friends fishing. He's gone back to that which he was called out of. His entire culture growing up was around fishing. The temporal happiness that he had seen early in his life was found probably with his father and his brothers in a boat fishing. But Jesus had called him out of that. After the denial of Christ, you can only imagine what his emotions were saying to him. Thoughts of failure, hurt, aloneness. So he goes back. He goes back to the happiness that he knew before. And they don't catch anything. And Jesus calls out from the bank. They don't recognize who it is at this point. But Jesus calls out, put your nets down on the other side of the boat. And they lift out more fish than they can hold. They recognize it's Jesus. And Peter jumps out the boat and swims to shore. Maybe wades, don't know. And for the first time, he has a one-on-one encounter with the risen Christ. Three times Jesus says, do you love me? Three times Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know I do. Three times Jesus commands him, care for my sheep. Jesus says, follow me. Again, the same words that he used way back at the beginning of Matthew. He uses again here at the end of John. Peter is gently restored to the position that he was supposed to have, to the path that God had laid out for him, to being a fisher not for fish, but for men. As we close, there are some in this room that for them, the calling of Christ on their life has not been fully exposed to them. There are some in this room who have been called to a path and you are fighting it tooth and nail. There are some in this room who have walked the path but have stepped away for whatever reason like Peter did. But in this moment, God is calling you away from the temporal culture, the narcissistic happiness into shalom, into wholeness, 
He's calling you away from that shallow love that the culture wants to pull us into, into a deeper love full of relationship and in the context that he has always desired for us. Our culture wants to make us content in less than what has been promised us. We have been promised an ongoing, passionate love relationship with our Savior. Full not of just happiness, but of joy in Him. Let's pray. Father, as we...